Vision. I'm Maggie Lake. I'm a host at Real Vision. And I'm so excited about this one. Um, we are lucky enough to have with us Denise Schull, founder of the Rethink Group. Uh, and we are going to be talking about mental models dealing with crypto volatility. And before we jump in, um, you may notice that there's a third chair over there, empty. Um, that is for a reason. It will be full uh, later, and we're going to do some very fun live mental modeling sessions. Um, and so I think that's going to be fantastic. But first, Denise, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. For people who may not be familiar with you and your work, give us a little, a little background. Tell us what you do and sort of how you approach mental modeling. What do we need to understand about this? Yeah, the primary thing I do is coach institutional traders or investors and investors on market decisions. I mean, we work with some athletes and some corporate executives, but mostly it's like the human brain versus the market. And how I got to be doing that is I got this master's degree in what's called neuropsychoanalysis, which just means how do you make a decision, really, like what's going on in there. And then I became a trader. And like they seemed like they had nothing to do with each other. But then through some crazy set of circumstances, they came back together in the early 2000s when the research was starting to show that you have to have emotion to make a decision. I was like, wait a minute, I know something about this. <laughs> well, and like that changes everything. It because does. take the emotion out of it, control your emotions. If you could do it, you, if you could literally do it, which you can't, even though it seems like you can, um, you wouldn't be able to make a decision. So I was like, we've got a problem here. So, so what Denise is not saying to you, and she's probably really sick of hearing this, um, but she is also known for being the person that the character Wendy on Billions, for anyone who watches that series, is models on, the therapist that helps the main character. Um, so that gives you another little idea to fill in. Um, and everyone tortures you, I know, and asks you about it's that okay. all the time. I, <laughs> but um, so, so bef- tell me, how do you go from being uh, someone who's, a scientist studying the brain to deciding, you know what, I'm going to put that off to the side and I'm going to be a traitor. What was, well, well, did you a, always that's have? actually, no, no, that's a. Because you've truth, actually done the job. So that gives you an advantage to understanding this. I yeah, think. The truth is I was dating a floor trader at the options exchange who thought I would be a good trader. And I'm like, I am not going down there doing that thing with you, whatever you guys, you guys do. Um, and then literally I was walking down the South street with him in Chicago we turned left in front of the Board of Trade, and somebody he knew from the floor said, you have to come, Don, Don, you have to come up to the, to the upstairs room we're building. And I'm thinking, what are they talking about? And I, somehow I got swept up into coming into one of the first upstairs trading rooms in like Chicago. Like quite literally, <laughs> off the street Basically, of Chicago. Um, it, the, the, the pitch was, keep track of our P&L intraday while you're just writing that master's thesis and we'll teach you to trade. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. But sure enough, in like two or three months, I was trading my own account and they were on their own. Um, And I did kind of have a knack for it. And that's why the PhD just went by the wayside at the time. They seemed totally unconnected. So when you, when you are meeting with a client or, or you're working with someone, what is, what is it you're working on? What's the problem? Make the connection between, um, well, what do we mean by mental models? That might be a good start. So when we're talking about this, what, are, what does that mean? Well, to me, it means a model of their mind. Um, to them, it usually starts out meaning something different, like what's their model of other players in the market? Um, ah, that's interesting. What I'm trying to do is help them understand how their mind is really working in reaction to prices and however else they analyze the market, which is usually not how they think it's working. You know, they think they're doing their analysis and coming up with some conclusion and buying or selling based on that conclusion. That's actually not what's really happening. (laughs) And we're going to find out why that is. But are they unhappy with the way they're performing? Is that usually what it is? Is it around something that they're not measuring up somehow? The majority of people call to solve a problem. Uh, Some people call just, you know, it's a new year and we want to get better and we want to be, you know, execute more on our full skills and capabilities in in a new year. But most of the time someone's been in a slump or they've, you know, had a horrible trade or I mean, most 75% of the time it's, it's solve a problem. And so when we first talked about doing this, I was thinking, 
you know, when you're talking about dealing with volatility, it's decision making, it's risk taking, and it seems so personal to me. I thought, how can someone else help help with that? How how does your background in studying the brain relate to the problems they come to you with? So you're actually right that it's personal, but it is also like an iceberg um, where there's you know, superficial things that all traders and investors experience, like fear of missing out, fear of future regret, fear of being wrong, and then it starts to get very personal. But back to what I was saying a moment ago, you know, we think we do this analysis based on whatever our, our methods are, and we think we make the decision based on that. We actually make the decision on how we feel about that. And the behavior or the choice comes from how we feel about the analysis. So in hedge fund land, we call that conviction. Mm. In trading land, we tend to call it confidence. And you're somewhere in a spectrum of conviction or confidence. And maybe like on any given day, you know, something drops 20% and you're panicked, the opposite. So you're always transversing kind of the spectrum of confidence or conviction, and you're acting out of that. So this is a data set that no one has been taught to use, and I doubt very many of you in the audience have been taught to use, but you can learn to use it. So I help people figure out like what's really going on, because you have a kind of a fingerprint reaction to these mm. things, and even these feelings that inf infuse it, fear of missing out, fear of future regret, fear of being wrong, fear of disaster, which is a, a human condition actually. Um, they're very personal. And so someone might always take too much risk. They might always take too little risk. They might always get in too early. They might always get out too early. You know, there's various patterns of behavior that basically every successful investor and trader knows they have one. Yeah. Um, you can unravel all of that and figure out how your personality and your personal history is exacerbating it. And then you can start to disconnect it. And what happens is you can get in touch with your actual intuition, which is actually visceral intelligence, unconscious pattern recognition. It's a valid form of knowledge. Um, and you can learn to... The gut's real. Yeah, the gut, gut's real. Yeah, it's real. Um, somebody calls it fuzzy trace. I mean, there's all kinds of academic words for it. But you can start to learn to understand yourself mm -hmm. so that, you know, this feeling tends to mean that and this other feeling tends to mean that. And, like, if you're, like major league overconfident and sure something's going to work, you know, that's a red flag. But you can learn, you can build a dictionary on yourself. And so I helped them do that. So it's interesting. Um, first of all, we, we um, obviously, uh, the brilliant minds at Real Vision, um, Shannon, uh, had, uh, and others, had the idea to do this, which we thought was so fascinating. And then the last couple of months unfolded. And so they named it Dealing with Crypto Volatility a while ago, and Ash was joking this morning because he pulled up the chart <laughs> of some of it. And we thought, wow, we really need this now. But one of the things uh, that when people write in and ask questions um, during some of the live events, uh, I he we hear a lot, like, I'm trying to take the emotion out of it. I'm trying to focus on the charts, take the emotion out of it so that I can kind of make the right decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a, sure fact. That's a surefire way to act out the emotion sooner or later. <laughs> what, what you have to do is, is analyze the emotion. What am I feeling and why am I feeling it? Like, and then learn to answer those, both sides of that question. It's an easy thing for me to say. It's an easy thing for you to understand, probably most of you. But actually answering it accurately isn't as easy. Why Marsh, is that? Well, because we have, we've been taught not to. You know, it's a little bit like learning to golf or, or some other sport that requires real muscle control, you have to really listen to your body to be able to say, what is it? And then why? And what happens when you do that, you can start to say, okay. That might be a whole nother panel. Next yeah, that's time. a whole nother panel. <laughs> but like, the, there's a book, Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain. That's your brain's always predicting. It's short, it's good. Some of you might enjoy it over Christmas. It's very cognitive, how you're cognitively predicting everything. The anticipatory affect work is done out of Stanford and a group of neuroeconomists who showed like at every level of the brain how we're doing this predicting a future feeling. Um, it's, it's revolutionary in terms of learning to change our behavior. And then understanding how those future feelings are partially driven by our personal past and partially driven by our trading past. And there's usually fear, you know, there's some confidence spectrum and there's like fear of missing out, which really is future regret, which is really fear of being embarrassed. Somewhere in there is fear of being wrong. 
And then, you know, in, in, in crypto volatility, there's probably moments where we all fear for our survival, um, which is also the human condition. Like, at its core, your unconscious just wants you to survive. And so it will overreact to something that might seem like a survival threat, like a huge move in something you have a big position. And even just recognizing, okay, this feels like a survival threat. You know, you may have $5 million in your account and, you know, you're going to lose half a million on this, on this move. And so it's not really a survival issue, but it feels like it is. Being able to put it into words actually helps. It's called emotion differentiation and granularity. And there are, there's real research with traders and investors saying the more you can put your negative emotions into words, the more money you make. The exact opposite of take the emotion out of it, control the emotion. Why? Because you're sorting through the nuance of your fear and anxiety and saying, why do I feel nervous or anxious? And trying to answer it accurately. You know, maybe it is this morning's trade didn't work and I don't want to lose money more money today, and I'm worried that I'll have a terrible day. Well, okay. Once you like look at that, you go, okay, well, yeah, I am worried I'll have a terrible day, but what does that worry have to do with what the price is doing now? And by externalizing it, exposing it, looking at it, you have the opportunity to disconnect it. That's fantastic. We don't have that much time, because I could go on with him. Like, I know. Because he and I talked at lunch. and so Just like, for I know background, I, I, I saw them, and I said, you're not having this session before the session, um, which was not, but it was a just get to know you sort of a little bit about each other. You told me enough, though, I'm just going to say this, that I do think, given your background, there is a part of you that isn't completely comfortable with your success yet. I was just going to ask that. And... We want to get you, like, it's fine. It's okay. It's good. Like, you'll do the right thing. Um, but I would like you to, to give that some thought. Like, in, I think you used the word guilt with me earlier. Like, okay, then what's the guilt? Let's figure out what the guilt's about. And is it really even worth it? Or like, it, the, is there some place in your past that it comes from, which we didn't get to that level of detail, um, or is it just that, you know, you know, there are a lot of people who don't have as much as you and, and you know, you feel uncomfortable with that. But, like, let's sort that out. Sergio looks surprised. I mean, yeah, I came for the conference and expect to... Uh, <laughs> we volunteer. You get a lot when you come to a real vision conference. Question, uh, <laughs> but, no, I can, I can see it. Um, obviously, you know, going back, looking at where I grew up and looking even at family members that, you know, would kill to be in a position, not just where I am right now, but like even studying in the U.S., being able to go to school in the U.S. and have all those doors open or just even learn English. Right? Like my parents did a lot to put my sister and I in a school in the U.S., even though we lived in Mexico, so paying tuition in dollars uh, while earning pesos, um, and that obviously changed our life. And so looking back and, yeah, I guess knowing a lot of people that are probably deserve it more um, or wish they were here as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, I can definitely see how that sometimes makes me feel guilty that we can't all be in the same boat, especially with people that I know very closely. So if you were really my client, like we'd spend a lot of time on figuring out like how we can neutralize that for you and... and um, what we can do with it so that it, so like, I think the connection you made this afternoon was in sometimes you felt like you couldn't get as big in a position as you might. Like on one hand, you were nervous and hesitant, but you also sort of felt like undeserving. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I go back, I think, again, to the CryptoPunk purchase. I was really like, I saw that I, I was very red pilled. I should have bought 10 of them. Uh, but 10K was a lot of money to spend on this idea of, first of all, the JPEG, but then like this membership card into this Discord community with a bunch of strangers. Well, I really enjoyed hanging out with on Discord, but $10,000 is 200,000 pesos, which is a ton of money back home. 
So, like, we're going to have to end, and you're not actually my client, even though I think now you're going to be my friend. Um, <laughs> I've, got, I've got a homework assignment for you. I want you to make a list of the trades or the situations that you've got now that you do feel kind of guilty about or kind of uncomfortable about. I want to get them out, like, so that we're just, like, we know what they are. We know how you feel about them. Because that right there, sometimes you know what they are and you know what you feel. That's all it, you need to disconnect that from the next actual market. You don't have to resolve the feeling completely. Yeah, over time it helps to resolve it. But you don't necessarily have to resolve it for this first step of disconnecting. Because like the obvious that we can see, if you're successful, then you give back to your community, you know, which we know you'll do. But you're like, that's good for everyone, right? Um, but that sort of obvious reality isn't totally internalized to you. <laughs> Mind blown. <laughs> I the really truth have no is, words. I was on the phone with a client yesterday um, for a regular call, and he's like, you're at that crypto thing? Like, my friend Sergio's there. Like, you should meet him. And he's like, what are you going to be doing? And I said, well, I'm going to be doing a session tomorrow afternoon where we might coach somebody live. I said, oh, my gosh, you should coach my friend live. Which is how he got up here. Which is how he got drafted into this. Um, well, thanks to our friend. <laughs> um, yeah, and thank you for this. It's uh, certainly going to go back to the hotel room. And, and you only list. discard. Dis- and I'm going to show you how to use tutoring. Discord. Yeah, we definitely <laughs> made that deal. Oh, when uh, Raul was saying how hard it is, I was like, and no one raised their hand when he asked me who liked it. I was like, yeah. Yeah, that was in another, another session you may have been in. Yeah. Um, Sergio, you're amazing. Thank you for doing that. It, we're not done yet. We're going to call one more person up um, to answer an, an unanswerable. But Thank you Denise very much. can at least um, uh, walk us through. So if you want to step down and we'll fill the chair again. Thank you. <laughs> Bravest man at the Real Vision Conference. Everybody but buy him a drink tonight. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I think many we, martinis. Right? Exactly. I think we have Reed. Uh, in the audience as well, right? Reed, come on up. Another round of applause, Ms. Brave. Hi, Reed, how are you? <laughs> now, hey, how are you guys doing? Great. So I'm, I'm going to um, let you ask your question, but um, why don't you also just like tell us just a quick little bit about you? Okay, well, uh, in a past life slash present, I used to be a small business owner in the insurance field, but uh, as of six months ago, I turned into a complete degenerate um, in NFTs. So I spend 12 hours a day on my computer, digging in Discords, Twitter, and it's totally took over my life. Mm. Okay, and what's your question? My question is, um, my biggest thing is when to get out. Like, um, especially in NFTs, you know, there's an emotional attachment to the sum of stuff I buy. Um, part of it, I think, is my ego because I get... So into a project that I think I'm right, and then I don't want to sell. Some of it's the attachment to the community. But it's like clear to me that like a lot of these things, 5, 10x in minutes, days, like stuff that's like I've never experienced before. I'm not a trader. Like, so it's so hard for me to like know like just a common sense way to like when to pull out, when to de-risk. Like sometimes I make a good call, sometimes I don't. Like some of the stuff you talked to Sergio about with like, the, at FOMO, like I play it both sides. Sometimes I'm like, see my FOMO, so I don't make a decision that would have like, like I had one last week, like I was ready to click confirm on something. It was like one F. I said, no, I'm feeling FOMO. I'm not going to do it. And I knew 100% it's like something new. It's called Wolf Game. Sergio might know about it. That thing went up to 7 F in two days. Like, and it was, I was buying, I was like 100 F, and I didn't do it I, because I said, no, Reed, you're feeling the FOMO. You know better. Don't want to like systemize it like okay you know you make this pull out this and it's it's impossible it's like, a, it's the hardest exiting a trade is the hardest thing and this is why is. i said it's the unanswerable question yeah, it's yeah. probably the one I that mean, everybody wants it but um i thought it, a lot of people might be thinking this denise so. yeah yeah exiting trade is the hardest thing that there is um in any given market and i can't i haven't traded nft so i can't speak to it but there's speeds and rhythms about how they trade and as you watch the market over time, you develop unconscious pattern recognition for those speeds and rhythms. And then the trick is to learn to listen to like that little voice that says, in the speed and rhythm of this marketplace, this is probably like, you know, running out of energy. Um, to fear of missing out. 
like there's really no one feeling that universally means you shouldn't do something. Um, like a friend of mine who's a trader here in Vegas once told me a, a decade ago, if we had no fear of missing out, we'd hardly ever take a trade. Um, so you need some. Like it's not, it doesn't, again, there's no one feeling that absolutely means anything. So in that situation, um, I would have probably asked you like, well, what makes you think this is going to appreciate over what time frame? Like what's, the, what's your gut feel about why it's doing what it's doing? Um, and you might have had fear of missing out or not, but that you still could have gotten into it. Um, I would say that like trying to process um, trade by trade the feeling that it leaves you with is probably your best path. It's also, I think, realizing, I mean, NFTs are a relatively new market and the speeds and rhythms aren't all that well known and there's not years and years worth of, of charts and price action. And so some of it is like, I think you're going to have to stumble your way through it a little bit. Um, but the, the truth is, like, no one ever knows when to get out. And also one of the ironies of winning trades is they always make you feel bad. Because, and remember that, like, if you're predicting... And that winning trades always make you feel bad because think about it. Like that you're making money. Your choice is to get out now and give up the money you might continue to make, if, you know, or not get out now and risk it pulling back. And it's rare that you get out at the top, right? So no matter what you do in a winning trade, you're going to have given some up. So you should just expect like winning trades are going to make you feel bad. Like we expect losing trades to make us feel bad. We don't expect winning trades to make that, us That's bad. totally wild. So he's thinking that he has this bad feeling because he's doing something wrong trying to figure out uh, when to get out or when to take profits but you're saying you're always going to have there's always going to be some level of regret with that yeah i mean i mean every once in a while you nail it right and just get out at the top but like that's a you know that's more luck than anything you know i mean there are experienced traders who can in a certain instrument that they really understand get really close to the top and the bottom based on their feel but even for them it's rare so um, you just, you know, you got to listen to like, is this enough right now? For this trade, is this enough for me in this moment? You know, maybe you're tired. Maybe you got to take your kids to school or something. You know, like there, you can get out of trades for other reasons. Like if you're, there's, there's you and you're in the market and how you interact with the market. And then there's your psychological capital, your ability to interact with it. So like if you're tired, you'll take more risk. Remember that. Like, if you're fatigued, you just won't see the risk. Like, some crazy trade will really seem like a good idea. And afterwards, you'll be like, what the heck was I thinking? Well, you were just tired. Like, or if you've had an argument with your spouse, like, you'll tend to take a trade because, and then you'll say, why did I do that? Because, like, in an argument, we feel out of control, right? We're like, we're like why can't this person see our point? And what's wrong with them? And why can't they see our point? But you can tell your system to buy something. It will see your point. So it takes, you know, it, you get to act out that feeling of frustration. Back to action. Like the yeah, yeah, back to, to action. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think for you, given what you said, like just realizing that exiting, and particularly exiting things that are working, is really the hardest thing there is. So I would like basically say don't be so hard on yourself and realize that it's a, where you're at, you're still... I mean, you're trying to learn how to do something that's in a market that's still relatively new and doesn't really have established speeds and rhythms anyway. So you are like surfing in a tornado, you know. I mean, it's, it's as much as I'm in like these trends you're talking, like I can see like, you know, a project mints, it hypes up, it comes down, it flattens. Like it's the same consolidation and pumps, but like they're a little more unpredictable. But it, even with it, it's just like, it's just hard to detach yourself. You know, well, you don't have, so don't try to detach yeah. yourself. Like, do the opposite. Say, okay, I'm really feeling, what am I feeling and why? And embrace the feelings. Don't judge them. Don't try to get rid of them. And then you'll have a whole set of feelings, and some will be about the trade and some aren't. But because you're externalizing them and you're putting them into words, you'll, what unconscious pattern recognition you have that you just described, you'll be able to hear it better amongst the noise of the different feelings. If you try to set a bunch of the feelings aside, it basically just like constricts you. And, and then hearing your intuition is nearly impossible. But if you just admit to the feelings, 
and motion differentiation and granularity, put them into words, and like sit with them for a little bit, you'd be like, okay, maybe I'm mad that I didn't make money on that, or you know, I could, should have held that longer. It'll, it'll let you be more about what you're actually looking at by doing that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Making sense? Can I ask a question too? Because we're we're going to wrap up in a minute. But do and and Reed, you can answer this because I think other people. Do you think other people have that skill? Like when you ask, how do I know when to take profits? Do you think some people do know how to take profits? Is that is, is that like is that kind of the FOMO, Denise? That people are that they're not measuring up to their peers? Yeah, I, I don't think so. I think I think it's really difficult in NFTs. I feel like um, it's a really unlevel playing field because if you're not in it, like. I'm telling you, like 10,000%, it is the riskiest thing. Like, I'm the biggest believer in NFTs, the future, all this utility. Yeah, that's going to happen, but like, it's so risky. And if you're not in there 10,000%, you're going to lose. So, like, I feel I have an uneven advantage over 99% of the people because everybody gets in, like, people here, everybody wants to talk about NFTs. Like, I'm talking to them at the tables and they're like, oh, yeah, tell me. But I tell them, like, look, like, this is the riskiest thing you could ever do. If you're not going to go in all the way, stay out because I'm taking advantage of people like that every day. You know, um, it's not like we have black boxes and NFTs or these, the most smart people in the world trading like in the stock market, you know, that's not your competition. So it's just the volatility and the people in there and the emotions and the, the attachment to these pictures, which is like crazy, right? Like the other thing I'd say is don't be a perfectionist. I don't try be to a be a perfectionist. <laughs> I, yeah. I, as you were talking, I realized that, don't be, it's not a game of perfect. Trading's not a game of perfect. You get the, you get the middle 60 or 70%, you've killed it. Killed it. Like, you can't, it's not a game of perfection at all. Not even close. Like, get a little here, get a little there, get a, a, a big, you know, but there's too many opportunities. It's too unknown. One more thing I'll say really quickly. Faced with the uncertainty, the human brain is compelled to make a decision. Because when you make a decision, take the trade, it makes you feel certain for a second. Like, just get comfortable with the uncertainty. I hate the ambiguity. I hate the uncertainty. I wish I could tell what was going on. Okay, I'm going to buy this. Like, learn to, to tolerate. Even I've had people write poems and songs about the ambi- ambiguity and a- uncertainty. You just want to be able to tolerate that more. But by articulating it, always. We are out of time. Denise, this was amazing. Thank you so much. Reed, thank you. Sergio, thank you for, for walking it through and being our, our guinea pig today. Or-